evening, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Dean, that isn't Andrew Scannell, um, or the director of the camera later. I think the first thing is congratulations to anyone who actually made it through the tune. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, as I sort of got deeper and deeper to the ground, I thought I was yeah. coming across meeting Bones and Richard III before we the <laughs> Tudors. It should have been very impressive, but um, sadly no. Um, well, people who have been to these things before may have heard me tell the difference between a, a scientist and a journalist. Have I bored you with this before? A scientist knows less, more and more about less and less until he or she knows everything about nothing. And believe you me, that's true. I once had to share a meeting with one Nobel Prize winners, and I was scared stiff. Until I realized, actually, they were pig ignorant about everything except their tiny, tiny, <laughs> tiny speciality, in which they knew everything was to be known. Whereas a journalist knows less and more, less and less about more and more, until he or she knows nothing about everything. <laughs> well, that's me. So almost always on these occasions, I'm the most ignorant person in the room, which suits me fine. Um, on this occasion, I do happen to know something about it, because um, rather through accident, really, my house burnt down four or five years ago, and we don't think it was Monsanto. And um, I, um, I then, um, we then decided to, in our folly, to rebuild green. So we built a carbon negative house. We will never, we embedded carbon in the walls. Entirely by deciding not to use rock wire, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we used hemp and lime instead. And, um, <laughs> and, have, um, and we'll never burn the carbon that we, we've invented. So we have a carbon negative house. It was a complete light metal, but I'll uh, quickly say maybe it was really rubble. And um, the. Um, Probably. And several drops of blood. So I've learned a very important lesson from this, which is never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, whatever anybody says to you, Dream of practicing what you preach. <laughs> <laughs> and the result of it is so tight and so, so well insulated and so part of our renewables that we cannot benefit in any way, unfortunately, from the Green Deal. Um, and the question is, will anyone else benefit from it either? <laughs> and that, I think, is a question we deal with now. I mean, it doesn't look as of now as if we're actually going to get anywhere. I mean, at the moment, we're going to insulate less properties than we do at the moment. I mean, last four years, two million county walls have been done, two and a half million lofts. Under the Green Deal, Dex own figures over a whole decade, 1.7 million county walls, and just 700,000 lofts. So this is a really great leap forward. And I'm sorry, Andrew, is here, but we will talk about him later. He, of course, has a solution, which was conservation improvements. Um, when you're building all these new extensions you're allowed to build, you always have to decide about your, take up the Green Deal and decide about your insulation. But that, of course, got condemned as a conservancy tax, conservatory tax, which um, but it wasn't a tax and didn't deprive the conservatories, otherwise it was crap. Anyway, we have missed Mr. Stuttle, so we can't respond to this, but I look forward to teasing him later if I have a chance. And meanwhile, we will move on to our emergency first speaker, who I'm not to say properly for because Mr. Stuttle's absence. It was Matthew Spencer, who was the director of the Green Alliance, and a magnificent failure, really. <laughs> because there was a time when all the Green Alliance directors moved very smartly into government with special advisors, and you know, one after the other, after the other, after the other. I mean, one moved the other way, apparently, what else? A bit of an idiot, anyway. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, um, but Matthew has failed to move anywhere, so, you know, he's stuck, basically. Um, so you can make it that what you wish. He started off in, in, in his early work was in on top of forest conservation, which is reasonable enough, and then entered the government of green politics, working for the Carbon Trust, um, uh, Greenpeace, God help us. A renewable, actually, it's quite interesting work down at the Renewable Energy Agency in the southwest, where he started out the weight power, which is actually rather interesting, though incredibly overdue. Anyway, Matthew is... Um, also, can't help us, he currently sits on the Department for Energy and Climate Change's Carbon Capture Storage Development Forum. Can you think of anything less promising? Yes, well, they, they're, they're not meeting for a while. That's, that's <laughs> Why not? I don't know. When did they last meet? Uh, about six 
Um, how often do they use the Sorry, I'm doing my other job now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Um, so, the top, the, our homework was how do we join up energy efficiency? What would it need for the Green Deal to work? And what's, what, what lives beyond Green Deal? And I guess I'll start by saying that as someone who's spent the last 20 years involved in one way or another in energy policy, is to say that the story of energy efficiency is littered with the bodies of dead economists. Um, the, <laughs> people who claim that, that consumers would behave in a certain way and, and have failed to predict how people really behave. And to some extent, the same is true for politicians who come along and promote the latest initiative or the latest wheeze, which will crack um, the energy efficiency problem. And every time a new politician is given the McKinsey map curve, marginal abatement curve, which shows that the vast majority of energy efficiency is already cost effective and should be done before anything else on the supply side or anything that's more expensive, um, leads to that, to that misunderstanding that um, energy efficiency, because it saves money, is something that will happen automatically, and it clearly doesn't. Um, and uh, I, I think we should take a, a leaf out of David Brailsford's uh, book, uh, which was a total focus on the individual barriers to success. Um, and an acknowledgement that life is more complicated than any one initiative yeah. or one theory could possibly lead you to think. And, um, uh, you know, it needed money and it needed total focus over many years. And energy efficiency is exactly the same. It needs a programmatic focus with a series of policies uh, that tackle the individual and multiple barriers to uh, 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 businesses and householders doing the right thing. Um, uh, because, as Geoffrey said, um, we have a huge task on our hands. Um, the average household in the UK at the moment has an energy performance of D. If the majority of those have to get to a B or C, it won't happen through Green Deal alone, even if Green Deal meets government's expectations. So, um, I think we have to start by acknowledging that, there is, that it will take multiple drivers. It will need money, either public or private stimulated by regulation and, um, a, and a really good programmatic focus. And I would propose that that programmatic focus has to, has to tackle the trigger points in all of our lives when we do actually consider major retrofit and upgrade of our homes and our, well, our homes, let's not talk about offices. Um, and those are when we're about to sell a house or, or when we've just bought one. That's, that's one of the biggest. So stamp duty, um, EPC ratchets so set a long way out where we knew that, say, by 2020, if you had a, a house that was an F or an E and you didn't have a really good reason, you were outside a conservation zone, that it wouldn't be possible to sell it without it being upgraded. Um, I think we need to tackle DIY itself. And if Andrew had been here, I'm sure he would want to talk about consequential improvement. One of the cleverest and easiest ways to uh, take a time when people are investing, add a marginal increase to that investment and get them a much better return. And finally, winter. You know, we do all stop thinking about heating for about, well, anywhere between three and six months, mm. depending on the summer. Uh, and, and it's about now when we all start thinking, oh, uh, you know, are we going to have another cold winter? So, uh, boiler scrappage scheme, which happened very briefly in the last proper fiscal stimulus we had in the UK, was very, very effective. For every pound of public money invested, five pounds of consumer money was invested, and we got rid of some of the dirtiest and clunkiest uh, uh, boilers in the land. There are still many of them out there. Um, so I think, uh, I think you have to look at those triggers and then you have to look at what the deal, what will drive the deals underneath that. Um, we have uh, Eco, which I think is going to be a lifesaver for um, people like Thomas in the industry to stop the cliff edge effect of CERT ending and, and a new world uh, arriving without any certainty about deals. But, and the 200 million fast start for, Gre for um, Green Deal, which we proposed and the government took up, I think is a helpful, uh, but it won't last, for, won't last for very long. And one of the policies we think that could help create that, that uh, liquidity in the market for energy efficiency and energy services is an energy efficiency feed-in tariff. 
and think that there should be a balance in the electricity market reform that's currently going through Parliament so that it, it rewards the demand side as well as the supply side so that we can, we can exhaust as many um, megawatt hours as possible at the same time as paying for some quite expensive kilowatts and megawatt hours on the low carbon supply side. So we think there are ways that you could uh, stimulate liquidity in the market for energy saving that could drive Green Deal, um, but we, ha we, have, we haven't got it yet. And as um, Jeffrey said, uh, as it stands at the moment, Green Deal and Eco between them will see a decline in the market for insulation and cavity wall in, in the next few years. Um, so it's worse than CERT unless it improves quite dramatically. Thank you very much. I always thought that you know the you know when the left believes that people people live, people are less rational social animals than the left believes and less rational economic animals than the than the right believes. <laughs> well, what would they do? Who knows? But anyway, that's not a question. Um, Andrew, you have just, just the right moment for you. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming. And um, I was telling the story of the I did a policy exchange one evening when you just got the government for the first part of the conference. Nobody wants to talk about the environment, certainly not your leaders. Music on the subject, and um, or has been until recently. And um, Andrew, Andrew George was put in charge, and um, but he ran so far behind, he actually came in for policy exchange meeting, and it was actually ending. So, anyway, so you've done very well. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew was the MP for Hazel's Road, but until recently was housing minister, and he was one of the very few ministers who actually knew something about his subject. Um, I mean, I've been in for 20 years. I wrote a book in 1999 on um, energy clean and green by 2050. I think that's probably pushing a bit far out. I mean, fast, but still, you know, know something about the subject, which of course was absolutely fatal because any minister who knew anything about their subject was fired in the reshuffle, and you include uh, Charles Henry, who's an old sparring partner, policy exchange meetings of mine, who's also gone, who's extremely popular in book. And instead, we've got a health secretary who believes in homeopathy. The Transport Secretary is frightened of flying, <laughs> a renewables minister who hates wind power, and the environment secretary is a climate sceptic. Not bad, is it? Um, I would say Charles George Osborne was in Europe, but I think I'll be, be a bit too kind to him, so I, I don't. Um, so anyway, it's good to have Andrew with us, and um, we were talking a lot about the, the failure of the... Um, of the, of, you know, how the Green Deal is not going to anywhere, and what happened to consequential improvements, which we'd like to talk about. But we do know that Andrew, that Andrew remains busy, um, despite what he does, because in the top, he's said this before, in the top of his election, he, it says, Andrew Sarland working hard for Bradbury, Comstorm, Great Moor, Hawk Green, Hazel Grove, Eberley, Eberley, High Lane, Marple, Marple Bridge, Mellor, Offerton, Romilly, Rosehill, Strands and Woodley since 1997. So it's really amazing, you didn't trust at all. <laughs> yeah, you can't believe how delighted I am to be here. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, yeah, the, uh, it, it's heavily, by the way. Heavily? Yeah. Even better. Um, yeah, obviously there'll be a serious penalty if you missed any of those off the leaflets. Indeed. Any, uh, campaign will tell you. Um, in fact, uh, upon the squad rotation, which has left me with a little bit more free time, I did phone up my office manager who's in charge of these things and said, um, I, I want you to know I'm going to spend more time with my constituency. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we shall no doubt be returning to Heavily and various other places uh, more often. Um, yeah. I mean, my area of responsibility was uh, building standards and uh, more generally the built environment. And um, I've been saying for a long, long, long time, long before I was a minister, that um, we needed to get hold of the fact that half of the UK's carbon emissions came from buildings. Um, and it's buildings, actually, it's not transport. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's much, much better and more cost effective to reduce consumption than it is to build generation, whatever the technology. And as soon as I got in there, uh, we started uh, to 
uh, look at what the possibilities were. And in fact, the first thing that we did, that I did, it's got my signature on it in October 2010, was to introduce the upgrading of energy performance standards in new buildings by 25%. Um, so if nothing else, we've improved the energy performance of new buildings by 25% um, from then. If the standards are observed. Sorry? If the standards are observed. Yes, uh, you're right that that's an important qualification. And I'm glad you prompted me, because I might have forgotten to mention the work we're doing on compliance. Uh, because compliance is a serious issue, and I've got a few, few stories to say, a few things to say about that. Um, the, um, the energy performance of buildings is uh, basically set by something called the building regulations. And there is a regime for upgrading and revising those, which runs on a three-year cycle. Um, so the next upgrading, there having been one in October 2010, is due to be in October of next year. And we've been through a long sequence of discussing and deciding what we were going to uh, propose and to then consult on those proposals. And that consultation, public consultation, was launched in January. Uh, it closed some time ago. We, uh, the department has the results of that consultation and will no doubt be announcing what it wants to do shortly. I shan't be doing that, but it will be done by my successor, um, Don Foster. Um, that will, I mean, building regulations, thanks, I have to say, to a private member's bill, which I steered through Parliament, uh, can deal with matters of energy efficiency and performance and building sustainability in a way that previously they couldn't. Um, and so there are some uh, there's capacity in the system to make changes uh, in the direction that I want to go and I'm sure people in this room want to go, which is to improve the performance of new buildings. Um, but also in there is the capacity to require improvements in the performance of existing buildings. Mm -hmm. And the circumstances in which that might be required are uh, part of the consultation that we had in January. And uh, the general form of how you might do it is you would say not to go along to any old house in the street and say you've got to carry out certain work to make it uh, more energy efficient, but to say as you are doing something else, putting up an extension, putting a bedroom in the loft, uh, as a consequence of that, you have to make some other improvements. Hence the phrase consequential improvements. Uh, so we also consulted on consequential improvements. Uh, what should be the trigger for the consequential improvements, what should be the extent of the improvements that it was realistic to ask. And uh, we suggested two, uh, well, we suggested a series of things that might trigger those consequential improvements. Uh, some of them got a very distinct, I'm, I'm not supposed to say this, of course, <laughs> uh, so we haven't published the consultation responses. Some of them got a very distinct thumbs down. People thought it was unreasonable to impose those improvements in certain circumstances and in certain other circumstances they thought it would be reasonable. Uh, we haven't, they, sorry, <coughs> the department hasn't published its response to that. I'm strongly in favour of having a powerful consequential improvements programme and I think it should be, um, uh, or it makes sense, it's a, it makes very strong policy sense for that to be something that's conditional on the availability of the Green Deal. To say that if you're eligible for the Green Deal, you're also required to do consequential improvements, or looking at the other way around, if you're in a situation which requires consequential improvements, you are eligible for the Green Deal. So, it, it's in, a, in essence, it provides a stick to go alongside the carrot of the Green Deal in order to accelerate the improvement in the performance of existing homes, uh, which is very definitely needed. And one of my questions all along has been, if I had £100 million, which, believe me, I don't. But if I had £100 million to spend on a policy, what would be the policy that would save the most carbon with my £100 million? And it certainly isn't building offshore wind farms. It isn't putting solar panels on everybody's roof. It isn't building zero-carbon homes new. It is raising uh, G graded, F and G graded homes to being C and D graded homes. If you've got... Uh, sometimes the boat analogy helps. If you've got a fleet of boats on the local lake and some have got very big holes in and some have got very small holes in, 
it's really much easier to fill the big holes and stop those boats sinking than it is to mess about with the pinholes that you can't really get, which is your zero carbon home that you're trying to make absolutely airtight and waterproof and all those kind of things. So you save a lot more carbon and a lot less money if you improve the existing building stock, and it is the cheapest way of reducing carbon emissions. There is no cheaper way, no cheaper combination of policies, generation, transmission, construction, anything else that works better than that. Um, that doesn't mean it's an easy argument to win, because it's actually um, very, very unsexy. Um, I mean, zero carbon homes, which we're also committed to, and I steered through the, um, uh, the, the renewal of the commitment to have zero carbon homes by 2016 and re re uh, zero carbon non-domestic buildings by 2019. Uh, we reaffirmed that. Uh, and if you like, that's the sexy bit. You know, Britain is committed, or England anyway, we don't cover Scotland and Wales, England is committed to zero carbon homes by 2016. We can all feel good about that. We can go to our international conferences and get medals and people come and look at them. Uh, and, and I'm thoroughly in favor of that. But if you think that building not very many zero carbon homes between now and 2016, or the next 10 years after that, the, the number of homes which will be built zero carbon from 2016 for the next 20 years is absolutely outweighed by the, by the non-zero carbon F and G homes we've got now. And so we ought to be, you know, I'll come back to my point. But we obviously can't get rid of the zero, and should not get rid of the zero carbon homes commitment, although it's an expensive one. It's an expensive way of saving carbon, but it's a good way of getting a medal on your chest. Um, so what about compliance? Well. Um, I'll let you into a secret, though. It's a well-published secret. Um, even when the best builders in the country set out to build a zero-carbon home and know that they are going to be inspected and that there's going to be an academic study afterwards, so they're putting their very, very, very best efforts into making it a zero-carbon home. When it's built and when it's tested, it turns out to only have 42% of the performance that it should have. And anybody who wants more information on that, just have a look at the, the study on Elm Tree Muse, which was built for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation uh, in York, uh, on, on which those studies were done. Um, it's very, very difficult to build a zero carbon home, mm -hmm. and we, we're not really entirely smart enough to do it. So it's a really, really challenging thing to do and very expensive. Um, which means that if you look at another problem that we've got, which is we're not building nearly enough homes altogether. I mean, last year, 120,000 new homes were built. Uh, 120,000 new homes were built, and 230,000 new households were formed. So the problem actually got worse by more than 100,000 uh, last year. Uh, and that's, although the, the total of homes built was exceptionally low, it's also the case that the rate of household formation has exceeded the rate of construction every year for more than the last 10 years. So the gap between the homes needed and the homes built has been widening um, uh, year on year. So understandably and quite rightly, the government has laid a lot of emphasis on how to accelerate housing construction, which is where you get to the really interesting one. Um, if your homes are going to be terribly expensive because they're to a very high environmental standard, but it doesn't really matter because there's so few of them, how do you trade quality against a quantity? And, you know, it's a good question for Liberal Democrats. We all want zero carbon homes and we all want, you know, 250,000 new homes built a year. Well, you probably can't have both because the cost, you know, there's only that much money you can invest and so where does it go? So there are some real and very stark political choices which have to be made. And um, there's, um, you perhaps won't be surprised to know that I've been arguing very, very strongly that quality is the direction we should go in, but it's going to disappoint a lot of Liberal Democrats that we don't get your housing waiting list down as quickly as you would like, because we won't be building as many homes if I win that argument. If other people win the other argument, you will get 
closer to the sort of numbers that you want, but we will be further behind in the, in the environmental performance that we want. So when you've, had, when you've got the zero carbon homes, top level, high quality stuff, compliance issues at the top level, more and more and more it's obvious that what we should be doing is tackling building standards for existing homes. Um, and um, I think it wouldn't be revealing any particular surprises to people that uh, that is probably something I shall have more to say about in due course. Thank you. know that the process of um, uh, writing round uh, on a consultation document has to be cleared right round the system. It isn't possible for me to put out a consultation document saying I want England, Britain to fly to the moon yeah, and, and exactly. it all has to be signed yeah. off. So that consultation document, you'll be well aware, could not have reached the open air without um, clearance at all levels. <laughs> Cryptic terminology, but there we are. <laughs> anyway, we'll now move on to the man who's about to go into business, I think. <coughs> um, Thomas is the Managing Director of the UK and Business Allowing Business of Rockwell. We did actually use some Rockwell, I have to say. It's in, it's in, it's in the route, and someone did tell us it was the, it was the lowest carbon of all the um, sort of non organic um, uh, insertion materials. So one of the successes of these is trying to say it's not organic substance, which from the land of rock growing, which any speed is rather interesting. Anyway, Thomas is, um, um, he's been here since 2011. He was um, in Asia, and he must be regretting coming to Britain with the bottom for the open market. It's a very difficult comparison, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy it here. <laughs> tell us, well, tell us, tell us. Tell us what you. What you well, I was in Southeast Asia for three years, and uh, mm. you can guess for yourself what I miss. Mm. Uh, but mm. in terms of the whole experience for the family and also for business wise, it's very good, uh, good to be back in Europe, I have to say. Mm. So it's what a good experience to have been there, and it's also very nice to be here. Mm. It's very so diplomatic. And so, will we all become like Denmark? What's the future for Britain? In terms of energy efficiency in buildings. I'm trying to encourage you to Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. <laughs> and, and thanks, Matthew, for, for your concern for the insulation industry. Uh, I'm, I'm not so concerned, I have to say. Surely there will be uh, a bumpy road for a period, but uh, at the end of the day, as Andrew just said, there's only way for, one way forward if you want to do something about uh, saving carbon, and that is to go for buildings. because. It is where you get most bang for the box. Um, and we meet uh, at uh, very exciting times and very important times. I have a few perspectives to Green Deal that I'd like to, <coughs> to touch on today. But before I do that, maybe for those of you who don't know who Rockwell is, um, Rockwell is a Danish company. It's a global company. It is uh, the world's largest manufacturer of stonewall insulation. And in terms of insulation as a total category, it's the second largest uh, manufacturer in the world. We have a factory in South Wales, and we employ roughly 400 people in the UK, mostly in South Wales, but we cover the whole nation. Uh, on a global scale, we operate in, in 30 plus countries. And we do consider ourselves, even we manufacture and sell insulation, we do consider ourselves actually to be kind of experts on how to make sure buildings are both energy efficient but also comfortable, because those two uh, go very much hand in hand, um, no matter if it is residential homes or if it is commercial buildings. So the Green Deal, which is about to be launched, definitely has the uh, potential, the way we see it, to transform the UK's building stock. It will reduce carbon emissions, cut energy bills, and create skilled green jobs, not to forget. We've been supporting the whole process leading up to the legislation, and uh, we're also members of the Green Deal Finance Company. When we move into next year, we do see ourselves 
delivering a big part of what would be a Green Deal package, not only the insulation, but much more. When I came to UK two years ago, uh, it was really fascinating, and one of the big differences from Asia to here is the buildings. I was fascinated by the sheer variety of buildings here, um, from very old medieval buildings all the way through uh, historic buildings, Edwardian, uh, Victorian, uh, up to modern buildings, and even some zero carbon homes, although they are difficult to find, you need to know where they are. <coughs> but the reason uh, Green Deal is so important is that the building stock in the UK on average is very old, and that comes as a price. Um, if you look at the statistics, it's two thirds of the buildings that are built before two, uh, 1919, and it is uh, only 12% that are built after 1960. So in terms of new build and the new build ratio in, in comparison to the total stock, as Andrew just said, even when we go for better and better new build standards, to convert the existing stock into high standards doesn't happen by building new. It happens by retrofitting what's already there. So because of these facts, it's no uh, surprise that if you look at the statistics, the European statistics, we actually have some of the worst performing buildings in Europe. And it is, if you don't mind me saying so, appalling sometimes compared to, for instance, my home country, Denmark. And even after 10 years of various schemes, more than half of our homes still don't have sufficient insulation or other energy efficiency measures. So if you look at the numbers from Ofgem, an average household now pays more than £1,300 for the combined gas and electricity. And uh, that's an increase of 65% since 2009. Mm. So I, I don't think we need to go more into the numbers. It's, it's really a, a very important issue. Uh, if you look at it from a, a country perspective, UK, like most countries in EU, uh, if you look at the statistics, then you can see that 40% of the energy is consumed in buildings. So if you want to save on your carbon emissions, you need to address the buildings. Um, and, and that is on top of the impact it would have for the occupants, the owners of the buildings. It is really vital that we get to, to uh, grips with energy efficiency in buildings and how to tackle this problem. It is about making the homes better, keeping the people warm, the homes more comfortable, drying down the builds, and also supporting the jobs, of course, in my industry, in the construction industry. Our goal as Rockwood is to go out and, and run projects that neither compromise on the style of a building. We want to maintain the aesthetics of, of our buildings. We want to build new that looks fantastic. Um, we want to have safe buildings. We want to have energy efficient buildings. So specifying the right types of insulation and also other uh, building materials can really boost the energy efficiency, but at the same time make the buildings much more comfortable, quieter, safer, and uh, in case of uh, the very uh, talked about the solution now, render the external insulation, uh, deliver buildings that really look good, that are breathtaking, uh, or if you don't want to go to those superlatives, at least look like a normal, a normal house. So if you have bricks today, you can get bricks tomorrow. <coughs> you have a, a traditional looking building today with all the different aesthetical features. You can actually have that tomorrow, even if you upgrade the building. And they will be much more comfortable living in. Our experience in the UK ranged from uh, local authority projects with a lot of few poor <coughs> people, for instance the Walsall Estate, to big one-off projects like the wastewater treatment works in Peacehaven where we did a green roof feature. Um, and it also goes across the globe. Because we are operating globally, we have experience with these things uh, from Europe, but also, for instance, in Asia, where we did the uh, Twin Towers, Petronas Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur and the Convention Center, mm -hmm. airport projects and so on. Mm -hmm. And in all of these different types of projects, being residential, being commercial, being uh, health, ed education, offices, we can see that insulation can make buildings much nicer uh, places to live in and to work in at the same time as you save the energy and make them greener. 
I have a, an interesting uh, example of what Andrew said, that it's not easy. We did what was supposed to be the most energy efficient office building in uh, 1999, back in Denmark at the Rockwood headquarters. It was uh, designed <coughs> to two liters of oil per square meter per year. That was sort of the way we measured it. Passive house standard, if you go by, by that standard, we reached four liters. So we we missed the target. Being rock wall, using the best mm. architects, the best specialists, the best materials, very expensive windows, mm. we missed the target by 100%. It's still the most energy efficient uh, office building in the world because four <laughs> liters is still very low. <laughs> but we didn't get it right. And it, it was in the details. Not so much the craftsmanship, but it was really in the details. Um, so it is difficult, but on the other hand, it, 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 you can still uh, achieve a lot. Mm. But then coming back to the Green Deal, we contemplate the, the launch of the Green Deal, uh, or as we contemplate the launch of the Green Deal, we, we see the challenge really is to ensure that householders take up this opportunity to improve their properties. You asked uh, in the beginning, will, will Green Deal benefit anybody? We certainly hope so, but it's not a given. It doesn't happen by itself. Uh, we believe it requires intensification. We believe it requires communication to encourage people to go into this Green Deal mechanism and, uh, and use the Green Deal to make their homes better places to live. It also requires that new and outgoing energy efficiency programs are joined up to avoid uh, causing confusion. We have something that's already in place, we have something new coming, and Rockwool, uh, like a lot of other uh, parties, have some concerns about the gap there will be between the delivery of Green Deal and ECO and the end of the current scheme's CERN and SESP. Because the Green Deal is meant to be in place from December. And uh, what we hear, it will only be fully functional from autumn 2013. Mm. And if that indeed is the case, that could cause a shortfall in projects from now until same time next year. Uh, and it will uh, result both in a period of very few homes actually being improved, so we won't have carbon saving for that period, but there's also a real risk to the delivery arm that has been built up to deliver certain sets and now have to potentially wait until the Green Deal really flies. So um, that's one concern. The other one is that all experiences from other countries show, or at least the countries rock would operate in, and that's from Asia to North America to Europe. Um, such a program as Green Deal is not necessarily taken up if it, is, if it has to have on a voluntary basis. Mm. Even in, in high insulation countries, high energy efficiency countries with great awareness like Germany, uh, Sweden, Austria, you need to have a combination of incentives or state and awareness and pull from the market. So we believe that a public information campaign is really needed to independently signpost the benefits of the Green Deal to the householders and uh, to build consumer confidence ahead of the commercial, uh, commercial uh, organizations entering the Green Deal, the energy uh, companies or the uh, retailers or the distribution channels, whoever decides to be a Green Deal provider. And the last thing I would like to say is we also be believe there should be a very clear roadmap with overall targets and milestones, both for eco and for Green Deal. There should be a publicly stated vision of success. When is Green Deal actually a success? Now the framework is in place. Is that a success? No, it's not. We need to have households take it up. And there should be some uh, milestones in place so we can measure it. And so we can uh, hopefully drive further policy measures and actions that will be necessary to ensure that this whole thing becomes a success. And uh, in order to do, to do that, we actually need data on how buildings perform both pre and post a Green Deal uh, package. Because without these data, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to measure the success. But despite all these reservations that you may, may get the impression that are a bit negative, it's not the case. We, should, we do see Green Deal as a huge opportunity, and uh, it is more than just a UK-wide environmental program. Uh, 
Uh, as you all know, the government has pledged that the Green Deal will introduce the greatest home refurbishment uh, program since the Second World War. And that requires developers, homeowners, architects, people like myself, to embrace Green Deal, embrace new materials and new ways of, uh, of working. And the Green Deal even promises much more than that. So for instance, companies like Rockwool and many in our industry and many of our partners, we are investing in new green jobs and green skills that will help drive UK economy growth and recovery. So the green sector is certainly a growing industry for this country, like we've seen it in, in other countries. One of, the, one of the initiatives, one of the policy initiatives, Rockwood likes to uh, mention, and which we believe really might provide some insight to the UK, is from Germany, is the KFW program. I don't know if you know it. If you don't, you should have a look at it. Uh, this program has uh, its government uh, support and it has uh, significantly impacted on the number of energy improvements in Germany. Uh, it has meant not only a large reduction in the level of carbon emissions, but it's also created a lot of jobs. It has uh, created and protected more than 300,000 jobs. And I think the most important thing is that in Germany, energy retrofit of buildings is not something you only do to save carbon. You actually do it to create jobs and create economic growth in the country. And the, their own calculations show that every time you put a euro into energy retrofit of existing homes, the country gets four, five euro back. In summary, Rockwood would really like to see the government address the impending gap between the Green Deal going live and the existing schemes. We would like to call for a campaign to create awareness about energy efficiency and to create uptake of Green Deal. And we'd like to see a clear roadmap and clear milestones for Green Deal. Thank you, man. One last comment. To moment, I yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, one last thing. It is difficult and it, uh, and it is expensive to build homes, zero carbon homes. I, I would, uh, I would uh, propose that we look to other countries because they have taken a big part of the learning curve. And for instance, in Austria, they're building low energy houses, passive houses, at no extra cost to pay. Thanks. Extensive company, how different everyone else has found it to build no carbon homes as well as me. Anyway, Guy, not last but not least, but unfortunately not less, is um, Guy knew you signed a less order to a man for this, which would give him great possibilities for funding and things. And very recently, though, he worked in the same office as somebody called Moore, and I'm really very it's sad. It's just there. So I mean, yes. Moore, I mean, you know, you're not signed more, but we'll miss this great chance to make all these funds all these years. But anyway. anyway, Guy is another person who's. His career has gone sadly down here, I regret to say. He started off in an honourable profession as a journalist, but has now forsaken the path of truth, really, to go into, uh, well, not quite politics, but sort of political wonkery, really, I suppose. But Guy is the head of the environment energy at Policy Exchange, as we've got several more time. I will stop insulting him and let him go on. That's right. Every time, Geoffrey, you're rude about the venue, rude about the sponsors, <laughs> rude about the panel, but we keep inviting you. <laughs> Maybe next time Damien Carrington will actually be our first. <laughs> oh, that would be very nice. That's it. Um, uh, well, thanks, thanks very much. I, I, I don't really mean thanks very much at all. Um, I was listening to the, one of the debates in the hall today. Um, and it was about uh, it was a debate on sustainable prosperity. And uh, Neil Bradbury, uh, who's a, is a Lib Dem member, a, a delegate from, from Hexham, he said, and he was talking about a kind of wider, wider policy area, but he, he used this phrase, and it, it speaks to some of the points we're talking about. He said, uh, he said energy efficiency was a, a no brainer, and uh, he called for, called for further action. And the, the phrase just, just jarred with me in the same way that, that Matthew was talking about earlier. And of course, in some ways, it is, it is a no-brainer because of all the reasons we've talked about. It's cheaper and as an organisation that's focused on kind of cost-effective decarbonisation, we're, we're in, in favour of that. But it's also part of the policy problem. We've been suggesting for ages that, policy, that energy efficiency is, is really easy and that, um, and that you know, the rational people that we all are will go away and uh, 
do what Jeffrey did and, and burn down our homes so that, <laughs> can, uh, so that we can rebuild them in a super energy efficient way. But energy efficiency and conservation and demand reduction programs are actually really hard and they're not free because you're talking about the kind of technical measures, you're talking about um, insulation and, and all those, but crucially, you're talking about people's behavior and you're talking about changing how people use energy. And that is, um, as, as politicians and policy people are, are constantly worrying about, is, is very difficult because people are complicated. They're not, not always the rational beings that Whitehall sees them as. So will the Green Deal be the thing that and the energy company obligation on site will that be the um, be the thing that cracks this behavior problem which is uh, which has been going on for years well it'll be part of the solution but on its own it's it's definitely not going to be enough it's, it's worth thinking about um, what we expect the green deal to deliver currently you know we have the, the certain the kind of energy company obligation and a few years ago energy suppliers were giving good discounts to people to deliver energy efficiency. And then as the targets got a bit tougher and we got a bit closer, they started giving it away for free. And now you're in a situation where you, there are adverts for people being paid to have insulation at home, and still the energy suppliers are struggling to provide that. So are we going to go to a situation in January or when, whenever the Green Deal is launched where people are going from, they can't even be bothered to have this stuff when people are paid, to install it, to a stage when they go, actually, this Green Deal sounds great. I'll have it installed, and I'll be quite happy to pay 7%, 8% interest on top of it. For me, that seems unlikely, although I think it's very important that we'll get the, um, the, the way the, the, the kind of awareness issue and the improved standards that the Green Deal um, provides should give a boost to the industry. But on its own, we don't think it's... it's, it's uh, it's going to be transformative in, in that sense. So the important thing is that the Green Deal is seen as a part of a layered approach. And we've got policy moving in the, the same direction. One issue that we haven't talked about today, we talked about an event earlier, is to do with uh, pricing, a good price signal. I don't think price alone is, is going to do it, but you know the biggest fossil fuel subsidy going in the UK is the low VAT on domestic fuel. Now, it's a political nightmare, and I don't underestimate that, but if you want a clear signal on which way you're going, and you can have measures to mitigate that, then that's one area. And as Matthew talked about, you've got to incentivise the, these behavioural programmes, these demand reduction programmes. They don't won't just happen by themselves. There's a few charities doing them, but if you want them on a kind of scale, you need energy suppliers to be given the potential for making money out of it, because at the moment it's part of their licence conditions that they are meant to promote energy efficiency. But um, that's not a strong incentive. It's, you know, crudely, energy companies make money out of selling more energy to people, um, not out of getting them to use, to use less energy. And we have, the technology is now changing, so we have a better chance of making this work. Smart meters could be transformative in this area. So we'll have the data that Thomas was talking about to actually understand whether these things work. Because another element or characteristic of the Green Deal is it's going to be, it's going to be based on nominal savings. And as we know, just installing insulation is not enough. It's about changing, changing behavior. So yes, the important ways of, of, that we need to set up uh, incentives for demand reduction programs. Matthew's uh, organization has produced a good paper on, on EMR as, as one way to do that. I'm probably, we're looking at something about whether you could do that through, potentially long term, through the brokerage system of the, of the Green Deal and incentivize uh, Way, methods through that way. So you've got pricing, the, the kind of clear incentives for demand reduction programs, and the third aspect is this this uh, a dirty word it's become, but kind of regulation and the kind of things that Andrew was talking about. And consequential improvements. He's, he's very coy about what's going to happen with it. Nobody seems to know, and I think that's a that's a big kind of test of where the the government is is heading on this. Because again, the, the, if you're focused on the most cost-effective carbon reductions, the kind of reductions that are going to be have the less, least impact on people's bills are going to be the most likely to be copied internationally so we deal with uh, the carbon problem, then you know, energy efficiency appears that way. Although, you know, as I said, it, it is not, not necessarily, necessarily free. So there's going to be two tests for these um, 
for, for how cheap energy efficiency and proper demand reduction is going to be. Because one, is it more cost effective than new ways of generating energy, um, which, you know, lots of people would argue that it is, although the demand, actually changing people's behaviour is more difficult. And, and crucially, the second question is, is it, is it the most cost effective way of decarbonisation? Andrew mentioned two of the most expensive ways of decarbonisation, which we've had a lot of attention on, um, kind of solar feed-in tariffs and, and offshore wind. Um, and if we can, if, if you make that comparison, then with the demand reduction programmes, if they can compete on that, should be should be rolled out as, as far as possible. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> We have two minutes for questions. So I'm <laughs> Can we extend the rule a bit? You can throw it out the room, I trust not. So let's go ahead anyway, and as we'll many as we can. So we'll get as many as we can. The gentleman here first. Hi, uh, Mark Thompson. I'm a Lib Dem activist, but um, I have another hat as well because I run a company called South Basin Services that uh, creates some software for energy efficiency in buildings. And as it happens, actually, Rockwell, well, subsidiary of Rockwell Build Desk, I mentioned Paul, my whole piece of software over the few years ago. So thank you very much. Uh, help, help us out a lot, set us up just before the recession. Um, I'm just interested in uh, asking Andrew, uh, he, he, he might know the answer to this question. We're a bit concerned about the signals that seem to be coming from government about code for sustainable homes and whether it's likely to continue to be supported because it does, it's one of the things that we do in our industry and some of our software supports it. And there's also things like Bream as well, uh, although I think that's a bit more solid. But just any information, any insight you have into what um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Spinell for saying the most sense I've heard from a politician in decades. That's why they're proud Absolutely, it must be. Uh, in pointing out that doing the thing that costs the least would seem to be the most efficient thing to do. And I suppose my question to the panel, therefore, uh, because as you say, the answer to the one of why were you fired is too obvious. My question to the panel is, how is it that we can't seem to shift from spending money on expensive <coughs> generation and put it into energy efficiency? And why is it when we talk about companies and we talk about generation, we talk about needing certainty and needing to put things in place that the companies have the right signals, in other words, giving them more money, and when we talk about energy conservation, we talk about people's behaviour and how bloody-minded they are, and if they would just listen to us, middle-class people a bit more, and do what we are going to find quite difficult to do, I'll bet Mr Lean found it very difficult to do, then it would be all right. So why don't we just kind of turn that around a bit and take the money into the tax system and give it out in the most effective way and actually do the energy conservation directly as a government programme? Uh, Dave Timms from Friends of the Earth. Um, obviously, I'm very pleased to see Andrew Stone put in a, a robust defence of uh, building regulations and consequent improvements. Also, very pleased to see Guy Newey actually taking a pragmatic and evidence based position on regulation rather than. I like than policy stages, normal position. <laughs> <laughs> rather than a kind of you know, knee jerk anti regulatory position you know, where the evidence is pointing in favour of, in favor of that. So that's, that's some crazy. I think that's generally policy exchanges. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, other, the additional argument that wasn't made about regulations is, is, is tough regulations is the money it's going to save people in terms of the addition that will go on people's bills from eco. I mean, as you said, the, the cost of getting people to take up SIR had gone on as the programme went on. And we've got this nominal £1.3 billion pounds that's going to be sent, spent on eco, and we've got a carbon target for that to meet. Now, I think it's going to prove very, very difficult to fit that carbon target within that spending framework. Is there a question about There is, if we don't back it up with post carbon regulations. I think that's my point, is the, is the NGOs are pretty good to point to plus question, is the point we need the regulations to drive down the cost of that policy. The question is, is there a danger here that what we do is we see promoting the Green Deal as the sign of success instead of seeing the uptake of energy efficiency measures as the sign of success? Yeah, I, I, I think the Green Deal has a place, but it isn't the objective of government policy to see the Green Deal taken up. It's well, yeah, the objective of government policy to let's see let's energy let's efficiency. Let's yeah, um, this, this sounds like a real thicko question, but I get bombarded daily by phone calls offering to fit me oh, with yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, unless, unless this Green Deal is going to be rolled up via councils or somebody that people can trust mm -hmm. rather than just being phoned up. You'll get people like me who say, I don't do business to coal 
with cold callers yeah. and missing out on it. So it's a, a tiny point, but it's absolutely huge. Most people do not want this bombardment and they don't know what is the good guys and what is the bad. So please help with that. Absolutely right, we yeah. have. We'll take two more, and the gent here, and the gent here, and then we'll have uh, I, I just think we're perhaps in a bit of denial here because the Green Deal is going to fail, yeah, um, as it currently stands, um, yeah, for all the reasons you just said, yeah, no one's going to pick that up. Eco is going to be a disaster because, um, you know, it's calling for a lot of external insulation. We've got a limited skill base at the moment, um, so we'll, we'll have a lot of uh, uh, labour coming in, fitting out jobs that. Uh, uh, go wrong, and then that will get uh, uh, massively on television by one of the watchdog type programs, and that'll be the end of that. Um, and um, you know, we're sitting in the middle of the biggest financial crisis that this country and the world and Europe has certainly ever faced. Uh, isn't it time we start to make some pretty fundamental moves and say incentive rather than um, stick? Yeah, consequential improvements would have destroyed the home improvement market even further than it is at the moment certainly for extensions. So isn't it time that we said, right, 5% cut in VAT for home improvements in 12 months, let's get on with it, let's start stimulus for the economy, let's start to make things move and get people back to work and get the economy moving and get those green things done as a consequence rather than as a threat. Um, two, two, two very quickies. Um, uh, I've been trying to kind of uh, finance a, a rebuild of my own house for some time getting the factors in, in mind. Um, uh, I'm advised by some doing about our friends that they don't touch previous schemes um, uh, because they complicate life and that if you want to do you know, the con consequential improvement type idea that you're trying to refurb a house and then you have to have these other <coughs> come in and it complicates it and they don't really want to know. And the other or the second question is, is the industry, does the industry have the skills um, uh, to, to do this installation work to the to the kind of standard, and Mr. Stumble's just kind of uh, blown a hole in zero carbon homes. I mean, and uh, is that not not consequence? Is, are they actually going to be to to to, to work and will they be able to, to do them, or are we going to get a lot of really kind of further, you know, crap construction? Um, um, well, I can't. Uh, I mean, I I can't comment on the codes and standards question. Uh, other than to draw your attention to what was said in the growth statement uh, a couple of weeks ago, which said that what it said about standards and codes. So you need to take a look at that. Which was what? Which was? That there was to be a, a, a review to mm -hmm. coordinate and rationalise codes, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there was a comment about the balance of generation uh, versus energy efficiency. I mean, well, I've said my bit on that. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't explore green generating capacity, uh, but it does mean that for the cost of a nuclear power station, you could insulate enough homes that would save so much energy you wouldn't have needed the nuclear power station. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem is, of course, that if you build a nuclear power station, you can sell the electricity and get money. Mm -hmm. If you insulate 50,000 homes, you reduce the amount of energy that's consumed, and so you reduce profits. I mean, obviously, if you save somebody energy bills, you're reducing the profits of somebody who's selling you the energy. So the market incentive isn't there. The market, there are what are called split incentives, and that is the challenge, that how do you get the obvious benefit to be in the right place for the obvious person to do it, to do it? Um, I mean, it, one of the advantages of various models of consequential improvements is it, you can have different consequence, uh, different things which trigger the consequences. Uh, buying and selling the property could be the you know, could be a trigger. It could be a trigger for the Green Deal. Uh, it could be a trigger for all sorts of things. Um, but at the moment, nobody wants to reduce the rate of construction, and certainly nobody wants to slow down the housing market. And in terms of are we for or against regulation? Uh, are we for or against extra regulation that slows down the housing market? It's yeah. rather hard to come up with an argument that says we are. Mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman who says, well, why not take 5% off VAT and let extensions rip and let's see what happens. Um, I, I'll leave aside any, any questions about EU policy and all that kind of stuff, but, uh, and loss of, 
so on. I mean, what's, what's in the growth forecast is basically making it easier for extensions, which is part of what the gentleman has asked for. Uh, but there is no linkage with consequential improvements. Um, so if you don't have the linkage, you don't get the, you don't get the stuff. Skill shortage. Uh, well, I mean, Zero Carbon Hub and a whole lot of other people have been working on what you need to develop the skills. Um, I mean, some of the problems with Zero Carbon Homes is about skill shortage, but it's, it's, when you read uh, anybody who's seriously, seriously into this should read the Elm Tree Muse report, which analyzes in great detail what are the design problems, what are the specification problems, what are the installation problems, uh, what are the <coughs> control system problems, and what are the user problems. And there's problems at every level which have to be ironed out. And to be fair, uh, a follow-up follow scheme is being built where the lessons have been learned, and I'm told, I haven't seen any literature on this, I'm told that the, the second try at it is a whole lot better, but it's, it is a real challenge. And so it's not just about blokes with blunt hammers who can't fix it, it's also about the fundamental design questions, the materials, suitability of materials, junctions, as, as, uh, as you say, uh, and so on. Uh, the Green Deal will fail, the Eco will fail, consequential improvements won't work, doom and gloom, and zero carbon homes don't work. I mean, if you come to the conclusion that no conceivable policy will work, then obviously the purpose of this fringe meeting is aborted. So <laughs> <laughs> no point over the fringe meeting, are you right? Well, no, I, I disagree because I don't, I, I'm, on, on that point, I, I don't think the doom and gloom issues. Yeah. Uh, I, I, no, I, don't, I mean, you know, there are there are risks with the Green Deal, but it's but it's an attempt to overcome one of the barriers, and we don't know what will happen because it's creating a new market that hasn't really been established, and you know, it might it might be a flying success. And I think the fact you'll have more confidence in standards, which speaks to to this lady's point about kind of nervousness about uh, about how you react, means it potentially could be could be could be a, a, a very good thing, but I think it will only work as part of a kind of wider wider suite of policies, as I said. Yeah. Just, Jeffrey or May, just take up to cover Please. the point. Um, I think the thicker question at the front here kind of answered how the problem is. It's very difficult to convince people that this is necessarily the right thing because there are huge suspicions of energy companies and, and yeah. you know, others at the moment. I think um, that's, so when I say we should, Try and open up this this market and to as many people as possible. Demand reduction market rather than just a green deal market. You hopefully you will get kind of more sophisticated attempts to contact you from people who who are slightly smarter on behaviour change. So you know local authorities, charities, um, you know d different organisations who who understand how behaviour change and convincing people works. What you've got to do is you've got to make it worth their while to be to be putting a bit more effort in, because at the moment, the, the incentive is to do the least cost way, and that's a, a kind of phone call, and they're, they're very reluctant to do the door knock at the moment for obvious kind of mis-selling um, reasons. So, you know, the policy needs to be in place so that that conversation on the ground is 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 much better. I think the gentleman's point, and, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be so negative on it, and it comes back to data point, you know, we don't really have a kind of clear success of what what is a successful green deal? What is it actually going to look like? And what should we be pleased with? I mean, it's about cost-effective decarbonisation, really. I mean, that's that's what yeah, we. That's what we need so to if I may come back, I didn't. You know, don't perceive it just being negative. Just perceive it as being challenging and saying, you know, if it doesn't work, what are we going to do? Because actually, those targets don't go away. That 2050 targets looming up and everything else. You know, um, uh, so actually, it, it, it's it's entirely positive in, in terms of saying, you know, we've got to incentivize homeowners to change their, their yeah. lifestyles, not threaten them. That's not for it, because the threatening won't work. Consequential improvements have been for years in Apple's council. Yeah, yeah, thanks, So, some positive points. Uh, yeah, given that we're coming to the towards the end of the meeting, I think the first is. Um, We've done workshops in three different constituencies around the country, very different constituencies, rural, urban, poor and rich, about the Green Deal and found humongous levels of interest and support from different stakeholders, from businesses, uh, uh, citizens groups, uh, to the politicians themselves. And, and we were really encouraged by this. They had some of the same gripes as you've heard on the table tonight, uh, lots of 
lots of concerns about how they'll get access to it, what they'll be doing that. But there is huge support for this, uh, uh, and, and a lot of enthusiasm <coughs> for it working. So that's something for, for everyone to build on. Second, I think, is I don't take Andrew's view of zero carbon homes, which is a kind of zero sum accounting uh, approach. You know, this thing costs more than this, therefore it's, a, it's less attractive than the other. I think the, you know, my experience working in the Southwest was that high standard homes with sustainable standards got plenty of permission easier, sold quicker. And, uh, and generating more economic activity. So I think, I think a sort of the cheapest only should be done is a sort of beggar thy neighbour approach. And we don't have to climb on the back of more expensive renewable energy technologies to get energy efficiency supporting the economy. We need both. And the reason we need both is because, it's, as well as the environmental benefits, it's probably one of the quickest and easiest ways of getting some economic activity happening in the UK. Energy efficiency, unlike road building, unlike renewables construction actually, is something you can stimulate very, very quickly. And we saw that with the previous stimulus in, whenever it was, uh, 2008. And you can go in three months from having no activity to having huge amounts of activity because it's a, there's a latent demand for it. It's very easy to do. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so there's both an opportunity for stimulus, but there is also an ongoing economic productivity to benefit to the UK whenever we do save energy on, on a long-term basis. And domestic energy consumption has started to go down in the UK. There are all sorts of reasons for it, but there's a, there's a productivity benefit there. And if we could get another jump in energy efficiency in the UK, people would have more money in their pockets and they'd have more money to spend. So in economic terms, it makes sense to push energy efficiency now more than ever. Very interesting. Good. Well, that leads on to you. Thanks. Final word from our on, on, on delivery of, of external wall insulation. Do we have the skills? Absolutely. Do we have enough? If Green Deal uh, flies as uh, it is projected, no, we don't. And it is certainly a concern. But I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we will overcome that because it won't take off uh, from one year to another. And, and for instance, Rockwell has trained, uh, for instance, unemployed people in Wales to do the job supervised by us, supported by the local authorities, and that was a success. And we are currently working on training installers uh, to build construction skills and government. Uh, it is a key to success that we avoid corporate work, so quality assurance, quality control, uh, certified solutions, and, uh, and uh, surveillance of sites is for sure very important, but I'm very optimistic. On um, to Friends of the Earth, I fully agree we need uh, regulation to go hand in hand with any uh, voluntary schemes and incentives. It's interesting to put the 1.3 billion pounds in uh, perspective. In Germany, where they are uh, admittedly ahead of us, the current <coughs> program is actually 1.5 billion euros per year. So it's actually the same size. But uh, it's interesting to look into all the different uh, leverages for, 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 for the energy efficiency. Yeah. And the final comment. Uh, Focusing on energy efficiency instead of energy generation, fully agree. We call it the sixth fuel. So we have the traditional fuels, but the energy that we don't use should be considered as a fuel and should be calculated into the whole energy supply uh, scheme. Really. Well, Tom, thank you very much. And now, for an hour, we we'll probably are going to throw it out or sunk, whatever happens to our ship. Um, <laughs> very, very much for coming indeed. Um, the one I did, I would have is how the um, how the zero home time twenty sixteen arrived in the first place, which always goes back to when David Miliband famously went green. Not David Miliband, but um, David Cameron went green. <laughs> and the two two Labour politicians felt they had to go green too. They realised one day they might fight him. One was David Miliband, but he got involved, which was very handy, so it was quite easy for him. The other was Yvette Cooper, who was stuck in housing, and. Um, so she went off around Denmark and got the zero carbon terms and came in, called me in, and announced you left the 216 target. So it all goes back to, to that brief moment when David Miliband and, and David Cameron met for the first time, one go into it, and one coming out of a friends of the earth party. <laughs> 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 <laughs>